Good morning, everyone. This is Scott Davis. Uh, currently uh, doing a couple different things, uh, but you see here, a host producer of The Morning Breach. The Morning Breach is kind of my little creation of sharing cybersecurity news and information out there. Uh, I also work for a company called LionGuard. LionGuard is a cybersecurity um, SaaS application designed for managed service providers. Uh, so feel free to take a look at that as well. Uh, but let's get on with uh, today's topic, which is critical cybersecurity components that are often overlooked. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to switch back over here to the slideshow. Um, and what we can see here is, first and foremost, a little bit about me. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, doing the work with the morning breach, uh, also with my uh, sales engineer at LionGuard. And just a little bit more about me. I'm innovative senior technology professional. I've been doing technology for over 20 years. Uh, I also am an adjunct professor with New Paths here at Harrisburg University. Uh, I have a lot of experience in understanding and compliance requirements and regulations. So in-depth understanding of the PCI DSS, HIPAA, CCPA, New York Shield Act, ISO, FERC, NERC, um, you got SOC 2, uh, and other state industry compliance requirements. I have contributed to the Patriot News, Penn Live, Fox 43, MSP Insights. Um, like I said earlier, I'm a host producer of The Morning Breach, uh, sales engineer at LionGuard, which is a Forbes top 20 cybersecurity startups to watch here in 2020. What does today look like? Uh, today's journey is going through four steps, really. So we have the standard security footprint. What are the work from home challenges? What are those overlooked cybersecurity components? And the most important of all is security training and why it's even more critical today. So the standard security footprint really is what you would expect to see. You know, your firewalls, your switches, uh, computers, your endpoints, uh, and email spam detection. There's not a lot of forethought to this. I mean, it's the same security footprint that we've always had in a technology environment. But so much of the standard security footprint just isn't enough to you know make it kind of to that next step, to that next level. When I look at what technology is today and what we can do differently in that standard security footprint, there's a tremendous amount of value. Um, you know, I like to say that everything should be tiered. Uh, you should have three tiers, four tiers, five tiers. There should be overlapping tiers. And you do that because not one tool is going to be 100% accurate to every type of cyber threat. So when I'm designing a network anymore or when I'm helping someone design their network, we start with a cloud DNS type tool. Um, there's a number of them out there that you know, what it's doing is it's taking all the DNS filtering off of your network and it's placing it in the cloud somewhere. Um, you gain power by doing that because there's thousands of companies around the world that are using these same tools. And what it's allowing you to do, or it's allowing the tool to do, is the capability of identifying, you know, malicious links. It's identifying phishing emails. It's identifying, well, not phishing emails, but phishing sites. Uh, it's identifying a lot of this up front. So before there's any processing or anything going on at your, at your network or with your end user, you have that level of protection. So it's not even getting to your firewall. So after that cloud type DNS, you're going to have to have a firewall. Firewalls are critical. Uh, so a lot of the environments that I've walked into that I do evaluate, that I've done evaluations for, I've seen outdated firewalls, I've seen unlicensed firewalls, I've seen people thinking Comcast modems are enough of a firewall. And it's not. You need a quality firewall at your organization that's going to give you security services, intrusion prevention, malware, antivirus, uh, really the tools that you need. Uh, and there's a number of manufacturers out there, you know, your Cisco Meraki, Cisco ASA, Sonic Wall, Fortinet, there's a lot of them out there. So there's a lot of different flavors that you can choose from, but your environment needs a firewall that has those security services. After the firewall, you typically have your switch. 
your network switches, they're just kind of there. Uh, they're there to, you know, wave the green lights, the red lights, having data flow through it. But switches are an important piece of your environment as well. And if you're not taking the time to ensure firmware is current on your switches, they could potentially become a breach point. And when I use switches in my scenarios, one of the first things I do when I walk into you know, a new office space is I look for open network ports. And it's not that I'm looking at it for a negative way, but how many network ports do you have in your lobby? If you have one behind your TV that's not utilized and someone plugs something into it, is it now live? So making sure that your switch gives you the capability of turning off network ports or just making sure that you're not plugging a cable in if there's nothing that's going to be tied to it. So switches are a security footprint. Uh, it is something that needs to be considered uh, and ultimately you have to be aware of what is going to wear within your network security. After the switches, you have your endpoints. Computers, printers, the whole new gamut of Internet of Thing devices are coming off of this and they're becoming endpoints. And if you look at a lot of the compliance requirements, if you look at what's new and upcoming, um, the latest PCI requirements actually require printers not to be on the same network as your uh, credit card processing machines. So you need a USB printer tied directly into that computer now if you're processing credit cards. Now there's a reason for that is printers A typically don't get firmware updates. B, they're an open port on the network. Some of them have multiple ports. Uh, there are a number of printers that you can buy that have Wi-Fi built into them that by default the Wi-Fi is on looking for you to set it up. So if all you're doing is getting the printer plugging it in, that Wi-Fi could still be active. So it's understanding all of the IoT devices, and this is where utilizing VLAN technology can be extremely useful, where you can have that VLAN for printers and have you know the firewall rules saying these are the people that can print, these are the people that can't. Having that VLAN for that IoT device or this or that, you really want to start breaking out your network using VLANs. Before, it was kind of a departmentalized kind of style, you know, accounting's on their own little VLAN, so there's no, you know, banging of heads, if you will. But really, any more in today's world, you need to have VLANs active and in use for security. Email spam detection um, is another crucial point. Um, and you could get away with, you know, that standard out of the box that came with your standard Office 365 subscription or that came with Microsoft uh, Exchange, uh, and it worked. But today's environment of phishing emails, of viruses coming through email, and just junk mail that comes out is so large and so ginormous that it really puts it in a tough spot where that definition on that exchange server isn't going to catch sometimes that latest thing. Uh, one of my favorite features in email that you, or two things that you should have enabled in email. One, you see more and more organizations, especially in the healthcare or uh, legal industries, are putting banners on the top of emails that are coming in saying this email is coming from an external source. Well, that's available and it's already included in the Exchange License or Office 365 or Google, whatever that you're using, it's already a function, a feature set. So turn that on. The second thing is a tool that will take any URL that's in an email and look at it before the user clicks on it. Uh, it may slow down, you know, deliver of the email a little bit. It may slow down the clicking process, but it's that extra step of security validating a link is a good link because let's face it, your end user is your weakest link. When the majority of cases of phishing, uh, of, of ransomware start with a phishing email, you know anything that we can do as IT professionals to ensure that we're putting as many safeguards in front of the end user without the end user realizing the safeguards are there. That's the win. So next, let's go into some work from home stuff. So 
Obviously, you can see I'm not on the Big Bang Theory, but because it's a virtual meeting, trying to find the right background sometimes a little challenging. So I went with this. I figure it's nerdy enough, but also at the same time going to be fun enough that you know we can do this virtually. But working from home has its challenges. Um, oh, I switched over. So working from home has its challenges. So you have a completely mobile staff or a large percentage of your staff is working remotely. You have to now take into consideration the internet connectivity and speeds of each one of those people. What does the remote connectivity security look like? How are they connecting back to the office? And do you know if they installed a third party tool like you know, connect to my PC or go to my PC on their computer without your knowledge? Data security and document management, I think is the most critical when I talk to companies about work from home challenges because you want your staff to have access to the data, access to their documents that they need, but they also have to be aware of the security constraints around those documents. So when they're in the office, you have complete eyes on them. You can see what they're opening, what they're closing, you know, what they're doing with it. Are they, you know, you have a lot more flexibility of what is going on with the data inside the same walls. When you have this remote workforce, it's is someone downloading, you know, the trade secrets of the organization? Is someone downloading this? Is I'm going to read about it on, you know, next week's, you know, whatever website it was posted to. So data security and document management is absolutely crucial. And you have to have strong policies in place that protect that. And you know, making sure that there's repercussions for employees that don't follow those safeguards. And you need tools and services that will identify and tell you how people are using documents. Team collaboration and communication is another crucial aspect because Let's face it, when you're in the office, it's easy to get up from your desk, walk over, say, hey, how you doing? I just wanna to talk to you real quick, uh, collaborate, communicate, you know, get the project done. And in this whole new work from home era that we're currently living, the challenge is how do you do that? Um, and I think a lot of organizations, a lot of you know, businesses, governments have figured this out because at this point it's been multiple months that we've been doing it. But Microsoft Teams, uh, you have Zoom, there's an array of tools out there that allow you to collaborate and communicate. Um, Microsoft Teams, Skype for Biz, or um, not Skype, um, Slack is collaboration. Then you have you know your virtual meetings, things like that. Device management is the last topic that I wanna kind of dig into. And it's because now you have all these devices and they're not within your wall. So do you have a policy that's saying, well, if this Windows isn't running this version, it can't connect to VPN until the update's done. Or if a virus scan hasn't run in 24 hours, it can't connect to the VPN. Um, consider looking at policies like this, um, or even a policy that says don't allow connections if outside the United States. Because really, does your business have anybody that is traveling outside the country on a normal basis? And when they do, do they need to connect into the office? So asking those basic questions, asking those that understanding of where your user base is will allow you to filter out a lot of the things that you can just block up front and be in a better and a more secure situation. So work from home, obviously, it's a complex nature, um, you know, energizing the staff, you know, ergonomics play into it. There's a whole lot of things. But as far as the network security goes, you know, put device management in there. Make sure the computers are getting updated. Third party applications are patched. Antivirus is current. And if they're not, find a way, and there's tools and services out there that will actually block it from accessing your network. And it will give you a pop up of why they got denied access. They do the update, they get connected in, everything's hunky dory, everything is safe. Um, you know, make sure you're managing your data. The data is so crucial. Uh, you know, when I look at data management today, I look at all the different compliance requirements and breach notification laws. Uh, almost every state in the country, in the United States, has their own breach notification law. Uh, then you take in federal governments. Then you take foreign countries. 
you know, if you have data on consumers in California and you do X amount of business a year, you could fall under CCPA and be a business located in Pennsylvania because you have data on California consumers. And that's how a lot of these compliance laws and breach notification laws are written, where it doesn't matter where you're located, it's that you have data on consumers in that state and that is why they're protecting them. So understanding the type of data that you have, where the data is, who has access to the data is absolutely crucial. And it's a great opportunity for you to go back and eliminate access that people don't need. Do away with these giant company drives uh, and you know, really go back to that you know, base policy of you only have access to the things you need access to to work. So what are you likely not protecting? And I touched on some of these already. Um, well, let's go back here. So patching of your operating system or other applications. It's one of the hardest things. I've worked in numerous enterprise environments where I've seen and I've been the IT guy that walked around computer to computer and made sure systems were being patched. There's a lot of tools out there that can do that for you. And you really need to utilize one of those for the simple reason of reporting. If a breach comes out and says, hey, this patch, you know, or this is a vulnerability, being able to go in there, run a report, and see what computers are applicable to that is ginormous. And that includes third parties as well. Uh, Google Chrome, Java, Java is a huge one. Um, if you have, if you're running a PC and you're using Apple QuickTime, that is a known vulnerability. Uh, Apple stopped developing Apple QuickTime for the PC. Oh, excuse me, for the PC years and years ago. So if you're running QuickTime on a PC, the recommendation is uninstall it. Um, you don't need it anymore. And that's really why Apple stopped developing it. Um, you know, looking at that cloud DNS management, even at home. So tools like Cisco Umbrella, uh, it's an agent based on the computer that it routes all that traffic, it encrypts all that traffic to the local DNS. The DNS is doing content filtering, really protecting your equipment when it's on the network and when it's off the network. Uh, multi-factor authentication. So I've been talking about multi-factor authentication for years. For those of you that know me, probably more than years. But multi-factor authentication, it is time for it to be forced to your end users. Uh, if you're using Office 365 or Microsoft 365 for email and you're not requiring that multi-factor authentication, you are not in a protected environment. Your Office 365, your Microsoft 365 tenant is not secure enough for what you're doing. Uh, it's just plain and simple anymore. If the service allows multi-factor or two-factor authentication, you need to use it. Um, I think Microsoft you know, I think it was like 90% of businesses that aren't using multi-factor authentication are prone to an attack. Um, is a research study Microsoft put out or something. It's just, it's ridiculous that it's even a question even still. Uh, and I know a lot of the pushback comes from the concept of, well, I don't want to type in my password and a six-digit code every single time. It's not like that. Uh, I think I typed it in two months ago was the last time I had to type in the six digit code and that was when I was jumping in on a different network where it didn't know who I was. Uh, for the most part, you type it into your Outlook, you set it and you forget it. It may pop up every few months. Um, same thing with your phone. I'm not typing it in every time on my phone. I typed it in the first time. Um, and every once in a while, yes, it's going to prompt me just for that security concern of, you know, hey, are you really still Scott? You know, hey, I still want that six digit code as a verification. But, you know, your financial systems, systems that have consumer information, credit card information, uh, company secrets, you know, all of this stuff should be two factor authenticated. Um, file and folder auditing, again, you know, I talked about data management, I talked about why it's so critical to know where your data is who has access to your data and why they have access to that data. And file and folder auditing gives you more insights. Uh, yes, Windows comes with auditing of you know that file folder level, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, 
it doesn't go nearly far enough. There are tools out there that will deep dive and it will tell you who accessed what file when. Uh, it can detect things like ransomware where a whole bunch of files are changing really quickly um, and give you an alert. So look at file folder auditing. If you don't have it, you really should. Um, you know, it's not as important as multi-factor authentication. It's not as important as making sure all your systems are patched. But in today's world of ransomware breaches um, and the whole ransomware to extortion, you know, just having backups anymore is not good enough. Um, the ransomware to extortion um, era that we're in right now is we're going to lock your files as a ransomware gang. Oh, you had backups, you didn't need us. Oh, well, you know what? Before I encrypted your data, I exported all of it and I have it now sitting, you know, at my computer. And if you don't pay me X, I'm going to release it. Um, and it sounds like that recently happened with Garmin, where Garmin paid a multi million dollar ransom either to get their data unencrypted because they didn't have good backups or to prevent the extortion. Now, I think the most uh, painful thing um, of working from home is, you know, trying to figure out these slides and everything else. So a couple other things that you're likely not protecting. The least privilege principle, uh, and I talked about it briefly. That's the principle of giving a person access to only what they need access to. Not giving access to this whole giant company drive, not digging in and saying, oh, you need accounting, you need HR, you need this, you need this. No, just giving them access to the files and folders they need to do their job. The wireless network one, I like bringing up mainly for the fact of when work from home just started, um, I was still working and I was still driving to work every day. And one of the things I noticed is many companies that had no people in the parking lot still had wireless networks that were broadcasting. Now, I wasn't going in and connecting or you know doing anything like that, but if you don't have anyone in the office, why is your wireless network still active? If you think about it, wireless goes through walls. It's designed to go through the offices and you know hit your area. So you had potentially an opening to your network that someone could pull up, sit in the parking lot, and no one was driving in and out of your office building and just sitting there trying to connect. Or if you're not using radius technology to tie into Active Directory for that users and passwords, uh, if you haven't changed that wireless password, it could be an ex-employee sitting there using your internet, uh, browsing the dark web, doing you know bad things, or I have seen cases that end up in court over HR reasons of an ex-employee goes, sits in the parking lot and prints a whole bunch of pornographic pictures on the printer to create kind of an issue or printing things that shouldn't be printed. And it's all, all because they knew the Wi-Fi password and it, they weren't kicked out. They weren't restricted access and it at, worked in the parking lot. Backup testing and validation. Um, so this goes into the whole business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, or even looking at ransomware. Um, if you don't have good backups, then you're not safe. If, you know, hey, I know my systems are being backed up, but it hasn't been validated or a test restore hasn't been done in a year, two years, then if you don't validate your backups, you can't say the backups are good backups. Uh, one of the simplest things that I recommend to, to you know customers or to people to do is rename a file and then call your IT department and ask them to recover that file. You don't lose it because you're just renaming it, but you're testing a couple things there. You're testing A, how long does it take to recover the file? What file did it pull? You know, was it from three months ago? Was it from a month ago? Um, and you're really, at that point, you're doing a small level test of the recovery process. Now it's file level, it's not an entire server, but that is still better than not testing it at all. Validating those backups is crucial uh, because when you need the data, you need the data. Um, and trying to download it off of a cloud 
uh, is not in a, uh, a fast process. It just isn't. <laughs> So the next thing that I want to get into here is obviously the security training. And I've talked a lot about security throughout today's session already, but security training, even remote, all users should be trained annually and have quarterly refreshers. You want to validate the testing with simulated phishing. Uh, simulated phishing attacks are attacks that originate from you and it's there to test how users respond if they're replying to it if they're saying yes i'll go buy you some gift cards or if they're clicking links um, but validate the testing that you're doing uh, the training that you're doing with these simulated phishing attacks structure training platform with human resources to meet your compliance needs a lot of the security training tools out there actually include bundles that are not cyber security uh, so you can get HR training. Uh, if you have New York employees, they have to go through certain HR training for harassment. Uh, so you can actually bundle that in. And what you want to look for is you want to look for a platform that you can make a universal training platform out of instead of just having, this is a cybersecurity video, go watch it. Okay, you watched it, sign here, you watched it, okay. We really have to do a better job of making sure that we're educating the risks to our end users and also refreshing that throughout the year on that. And that comes with, like I said, those simulated phishing attacks, but also going through and doing quarterly refreshers. They don't all have to be long PowerPoints or long videos, you know, choose some fun activities, you know, a game or something, just to keep the energy up and people thinking about it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, and security training, it's right up there with you know data management and data backup. Um, you know it doesn't matter if you're working from home or working in the office. You know you need to have security training. You need to have good data backups. You have to know where your data is being stored. Um, here you can kind of see. So one of the things this year in particular, we've seen just an increase of COVID-related phishing attacks. And it could be along the lines of, you know, from a new site of, hey, check this out of the latest numbers, or it could be from the World, World Health Organization, or it could mimic itself coming from your HR. Um, and when you're designing simulated emails, you want to look at some, you know, A, what is timely right now? What is going on in the world that someone is likely to click on and understand that you know, work off of the fear, but also off of the emotion of your end users. Uh, I've seen success with, you know, one that comes from like a local police department of like a missing child, um, or it's coming from a local news organization of the missing child. Uh, one of my favorite ones is I mimic the support ticketing system, uh, and I put a link in there, your ticket couldn't be created. Uh, and the amount of people that fall for that one despite not creating a ticket, or not sending something in to create a ticket actually was pretty amusing. Um, so use the things that, you know, and like I say, it's about emotion. It's think about the end users. You're not trying to spear fish and target a certain user. And, you know, don't send something out, hey, you know, you know, on like an obituary, uh, cause you don't know if someone, you know, potentially just lost somebody. So you wanna be sensitive, but emotion and fear drive the person to click that. Um, they want to learn something, they have emotion, they have fear in that. So my next slide here is tomorrow's attack point. Phishing is and will likely be for the immediate future the most successful attack surface because it works. It is effective. Um, I don't think there's any other way to put it. Uh, it's just end users continue to click because they're not receiving the proper training to know not to click. Um, insecure RDP, uh, your 30, port 3389, 3390, or VPN. If you're not securing you know, that remote connection back into your office, that's a humongous attack point. Um, 
one of the things that I see still today on a regular basis is brute force login attacks. Um, and the brute force login attack is coming because someone opened up port 3389 somewhere, um, either to a server or to a desktop, and that ping happened out on the World Wide Web, and a hacker or a group of hackers are now just brute force attacking, you know, administrator, key names. Uh, they'll even look at your website sometimes because, you know, once I have your IP address, you can start learning a lot more about the organization, putting a puzzle together. Going to the website typically gives you, you know, leadership names, email addresses. So now you have usernames. Now it's just guessing the password. You go into the dark web. Um, you can probably buy passwords for the organization. So now you have potentially usernames and passwords, and you have an entry point. And that took less than an hour, probably. Uh, your IoT devices and printers. Uh, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about printers how PCI DSS is going to start requiring that printers be off of the network of your credit card transactions. Well, they should be on a separate VLAN completely off of your data network and everything else. So if a printer is breached, the printer's not giving access back to your network. And same thing with IoT devices. I, I think one of my, uh, one of the most famous stories of IoT devices, and I'm sure everyone in the room here has heard it because it's said so often anymore, but there was a casino in Las Vegas that had this giant fish tank and they put a wireless uh, temperature gauge in the fish tank so they could monitor the temperature of the water. The last thing you want is to lose you know, thousands of dollars worth of fish. Well, that wireless signal and that device was actually hacked and it allowed the hacker to breach the entire network because it wasn't segmented. Um, unpatched zero days, again, Patch your systems. Um, you really need to have a tool, and managed service providers do this extremely well because the tools that are out there for managed service providers or your IT vendors do a great job of you know third-party patching and Windows patching. But there are the tools, Microsoft has them as well, that allow you to patch your systems and even third parties. So make sure that you have an automated delivery method of patching your systems because that again right there, if you're not patching your systems, if you're not staying on top of that, you're going to get breached. So that is pretty much what I have here. So I understand this is a pre-recorded session, um, but still my favorite quote of the world, there's no such thing as, as an unreasonable question or a silly question or a frivolous question or a waste of time question. It's your life and you've got to get these answers. Uh, that was an American actress, uh, Marsha Wallace. And, you know, if you have questions, I want to hear them. And by all means, if I can answer them for you, I will. My email address, scott at scottrdavis.com. Please feel free, shoot me an email. Anything that I covered today, I can break out for you. Uh, if you have questions on disaster recovery, if you have questions on, you know, phishing, if you have questions on cybersecurity, uh, by all means, hit me up, use me as a resource. Um, or at the very least, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I share quite a lot of information on LinkedIn on a regular basis, just covering cybersecurity as a whole, uh, data security, uh, compliance regulations. So that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Uh, I know it's a unique world that we live in that here I am recording and, t and uh, televising to you from the Big Bang Theory's couch. Uh, but, you know, that's where we're at today. So stay safe. Um, keep your friends, your family safe. Uh, and, of course, you know, we're fighting a virus as a human species right now. But as IT professionals, we're fighting viruses, malware, emails every single day of our lives. So keep that. Have yourself a great day.